Please be seated. Let us pray. God of our Holy Week journey, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On Thursday evening, I attended an iftar, the nightly dinner celebration that ends the day of fasting for our Muslim brothers and sisters during their holy month of Ramadan. I was the only Christian seated at my table, and as we waited for the sun to set, the Muslims, immigrants from Turkey and Pakistan, had a lot of questions for me. Do Christians fast too, they asked. I tried my best to explain Lent. It's very hard to convince people who haven't eaten anything since 6.30 in the morning that giving up chocolate is a spiritual discipline. <laughs> Some other Christians are a bit more strict, I said. Orthodox Christians stop eating meat and dairy and oils. Catholics don't eat meat on Fridays. And so then they asked me, well, why are there all these different churches? What are the differences between them? So I told them a little bit of Christian history. I said the Christian church was united for about 10 minutes once on the day of Pentecost, and ever since then, we've been breaking apart. Because of theology, because of politics, because of aesthetics, because of geography, because of race. We have splintered and splintered until we've begun to see each other, not as siblings, but as strangers and even as enemies. The work of ecumenism, Christian unity, seeks to reverse those centuries of fracture. Ecumenists seek to make visible the unity of the church, a reality that we proclaim every time we say the creed, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 52 years ago, the Reverend Lee Hicks of Blessed Memory, later a member of this congregation, worked with then Bishop John Wright to establish Christian Associates of Southwest Pennsylvania, an organization that carries out ecumenical work here in our region. We work with the Episcopal Diocese and 27 other church bodies, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant, to bring diverse Christians together. We try to discover our common ground, to work for the good of our communities, and to build bridges with our civic community and interfaith partners. We believe that by convening diverse Christians and building opportunities for proximity, we can encourage real relationship. As we get to know one another, we can move beyond loving our neighbors at a sterile distance and begin actually genuinely liking them. You could say that our work is about turning enemies into friends. And that's always a good thing. Right? The passion narrative that we read this morning is so moving and so dramatic and so foundational to our faith that it's easy to miss a small detail in it a verse that at first seems almost like an in action. After Jesus' betrayal and arrest, all through the wee hours of Thursday night and Friday morning, the prisoner changes hands multiple times. The religious authorities turn him over to Pilate, the Roman governor, the civil authority. Pilate, in turn, sends the prisoner to Herod, a Judean serving as a puppet king. At last, Herod returns Jesus back to Pilate. The political structures of this Roman colony were complicated. If you know much about the relationship between, say, the mayor's office and the city council, or the principal's office and the parent-teacher association, you can imagine that the interpersonal relationships between these different leaders were complicated that they might have been layered with resentment and struggles for power, with religious and philosophical differences, 
and with unclear lines of authority. Who's in charge? Who wants to be in charge? How should things get done? It might be easy to imagine that handling a troublesome prisoner, like Jesus of Nazareth, might have ignited conflict between Herod and Pilate. And yet, instead, the arrest and trials of Jesus did exactly the opposite. Luke tells us in chapter 23, verse 12, that same day, Herod and Pilate became friends with each other. Before this, they had been enemies. It might seem odd at first, but we all know how this goes. We have known since we were on the playground that having a common enemy can bring people together. I remember well one night when I was in college when another girl in my freshman dormitory confessed to me that she found my roommate extremely annoying and how delighted I felt because I didn't like her either. I'm not particularly proud of that conversation, but I can tell you that it was a powerful catalyst for our friendship. That girl and I shared an apartment for several years. She was one of my bridesmaids. We're dear to each other to this day. Because cruelty can connect us. Directing our negative energy in the same direction means we look to each other with new appreciation. We have common ground to work from. It can reassure and define us that we are not like those other people. And that's especially true when we identify a target of our cruelty who seems to have all the characteristics that we want to cast out. Ah, that annoying roommate, she's what's wrong with this dormitory. Surely it has nothing to do with me or anything that I might be doing. On a small scale, this practice fuels a million middle school frenemies and petty group texts. But on a larger scale, as the French philosopher René Girard identified, this is the ancient story of scapegoating violence. It's the cursed lo logic that fueled human sacrifices, and it is the fuel for contemporary lynching and genocide as well. First identify the other, then eliminate them, then create harmony among the persecutors. It works for building friendship between Herod and Pilate. It works for shifting the crowd who so recently shouted Hosanna as Jesus entered the city to finding a united cry of crucify him. And it is the danger that we face as well when we try to build unity by defining what we are against. We too run the risk of creating friendship by identifying shared enemies. We risk participating in the same broken cycle of bitterness, rejection, dehumanization, and violence. We can build unity this way, but it comes at a cost. And so thank God, there is also another way. Into this system of scapegoating violence comes Jesus of Nazareth, a prisoner bound and tortured. Typically, the story of scapegoating is told from the victor's point of view, with all of its ugly realities swept away. But our Gospels face the cruel facts of this system head on. In Jesus, God enters into this story into our story, into our broken system of violence and pain. In the Passion experience, God is not a distant deity to be appeased by human sacrifice. God instead becomes the sacrifice, not as an endorsement of the system, but as a way to end it once and for all. When they came to arrest Jesus, his disciples struck out against the soldiers with the sword, and Jesus said, no more of this, no more violence, no more sacrifice, no more shall community be forged by the blood of others. The cross stands as a once and forever, no more of this. In the cross, God makes a new way for our friendships, our unity, to be forged. 
There are other friends in this story besides Pilate and Herod. We find them at the very end of this passion account that we read. All of his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Even as so many of Jesus' supporters abandoned him, still there is a kernel of community gathered with him to the end at the cross. A kernel of community that shows things can be different. A community compelled to stand with those most vulnerable, those most in pain, compelled to bear witness even at a cost. A community where unity is not about defining who we are against, but about pointing together toward the one who saves. Where we can be friends because of whose we are and because of who he is. In Holy Week, as we make our way to the cross, we dare to reject all of the facile unity that sacrificial violence demands. We reject all factionalism, all nationalism, all racism, all snobbish quarrels. Instead, we build our unity, our friendship, on the rock of Golgotha as we stand and watch all these things. As we watch Jesus subjecting himself freely to the worst of human evil, as we watch him die at human hands, as we watch his tomb sealed shut, as we watch and wait and wonder at the new things God is doing, as new community grows between all of Christ's diverse disciples, drawing us into true love and friendship, as we keep watch together all the way to Easter morning. Thanks be to God.